Ensley League Extra is sponsored by Ensley, providers of motor insurance. We're in a league of our own. You are the number one. Coming up, how Dave Bassett's dashing blades cut right through Luton to hit six. Who's hit the bullseye to win November's gold and gold competition? And when the dock was in charge and Manchester United were facing up to life in Division Two. Good shot goal! It's all got star on Manchester United. Hello again, and in FA Cup second round week, we also feature Kidderminster Harriers, the side who made a lot of cup headlines last season, who went on to win the GM Vauxhall Conference, but who are still fighting for the right to play in the Football League. But we begin at the top of Division One. Our extensive roundup takes us first to Ayrson Park and Middlesbrough against Portsmouth. So much for no side running away with Division 1. As the crucial Christmas period approaches, Middlesbrough suddenly seemed to be in the right mood to make a breakaway. Paul Wilkinson's not been getting the goals you expect, so there was something rather ominous about his form at the weekend. It was two in two minutes, Craig Hignett finally seems to have found the confidence to go with his talent. Portsmouth, however, are slipping into sharper decline. Just one win in ten, and there was to be no improving on that record after Jerry Craney's clumsy tackle takes out John Hendry. Craney is off for denying a clear goal-scoring opportunity. But even with the chance to get ten men behind the ball, Portsmouth couldn't stop Hignett driving in number three. Two for him and two for Wilkinson by the end. Alan Moore was left all alone, but when he miscues, Wilkinson redirects the ball in. It's Middlesbrough's biggest win of the season. It's set them up nicely for the next seven days. We've got a tremendous week for us. We've got a hard game at Redden on Tuesday and then we're back here next Saturday at South End. And obviously if we can pick points up from both of those games, then we'll be heading in the right direction. But what's gone wrong at Wolves? After defeats two Sundays running, they were live again at the New Den against a Millwall side, boosted by a Coca-Cola Cup win at Nottingham Forest. David Pleat and Brian Moore are the commentators. Mark Venus taking the free kick for Wolves. Darren Ferguson just ahead of him. And pushed away by Casey Keller, knocked back in again and pushed away again by Keller. The shot from Emblem, the second one, two good pieces of work there by Casey Keller. Still with Thatcher. That's a good cross. He's heating in there. And off the crossbar from Dave Mitchell's header. A fine movement there by Mitchell. You see him just take Venus in there and hit that ball against, against, against the bar. Really sharp movement. Thatcher gets it forward, Mitchell chasing it, took that beautifully on his chest. He's got Berry up in support, but not much else. Now he's got support from Roberts. Two minutes shot just over that crossbar. Good climb by Witter. Emblem trying to get it uh, across to that right-hand side. But suddenly Mitchell's through. There's a chance for Millwall here. Just wide of that far post. The Wolves players are looking at the referee. Uh, felt there was an infringement there, but Mitchell here on his way. He looks up. Keeper coming out. 
and plays it just wide of that far post. A glorious opportunity, though. Ingo Stevens. Well, the Millwall players claiming that Kelly, that a challenge by Kelly was a bad one. Let's have a look at it again. Oh, my word. That is over the ball. Well, he's taking some action, David. Yes, it should be a yellow card. I'd be very surprised if he was sent off for that because... Oh, he's yeah. sent off. On the word of a linesman, presumably, the referee went and conferred to the linesman. David Kelly is gone. Well, I think that's... You know, it's strange now. The crowd are getting excited. It's, it's important that Millwall players keep calm. I was saying at half-time, sometimes the atmosphere here makes them play too hurriedly, too quickly. And the younger players in the team are a little bit nervous of putting their foot on the ball and putting some poise and some calm in the game. Now they've got the advantage of the extra man. Well, that's a good cross. And it's a goal by Mitchell. Well, that somehow looped over Stahl's head. Well, a good cross. cross. Marvellous cross by Kennedy. Stahl certainly misjudged it. Once again, you see Mitchell creeping across the goal. He's so good at anticipating and getting across the front of defenders. Stahl makes a little bit of a mess of it. A long clearance by Keller. Oh, it might come for Mitchell again. Just wide of the goal. So Wolves miss out on the chance to go second, but our Millwall over the worst. Yeah, well, that starts our run, hopefully, you know, but we've been playing tremendously well. We've been unfortunate the situation down at the club at the moment. We've had to sell players, but uh, as long as we can get, bring the young players through and play as we did today with a bit of passion, uh, I'm sure we can climb the table. 2-0 winners over Tranmere last month. Watford played with purpose and confidence at Brenton Park, but sometimes that's not enough. Chris Malkin's 10th of the season didn't look like doing too much damage to Watford's improving form. A minute later, Craig Ramage had found space and Jamie Morley's deflected shot had beaten Eric Nixon. And the goal seemed certain to earn Watford a point until 90 seconds from the end, Pat Nevin's cross tempts out Kevin Miller and Kenny Irons gets there first. Tranmere's eighth home win takes them up to second. While Joe Jordan was getting in trouble with ref Keith Cooper for dissent, things were going rather better for Grimsby's new player boss, Brian Laws. Dave Gilbert's crisp shot put Grimsby in front. City carved out a similar goal to equalise. Scott Partridge seizes on the half chance. But Grimsby's players have to be admired for the way they've come to terms with three managers in six weeks. And Dave Gilbert's winner gives the new boss a problem. He now has to decide if he's worth a place in the team. I've spoken to the players and said, look, I want to play um, in, a, in a various positions. I can play in various positions and I scored in reserves after six minutes, which is very pleasing. Uh, all I've asked them to do is keep me out the side. If they perform like they have today, they're going to keep doing that and it's going to make my job a lot easier. Back in the northeast, Reading went to Sunderland and with record-breaking decathlete Daley Thompson there in support, Reading won at Roker for the first time in their history. Here's Roger Thames. Plenty of activity again from the Reading forwards. That was a nice ball out wide. And knocked in and Quinn there just over the top. And the display of frustration underlining how good an opportunity that was. Free kick then. Gray will try this time. And his lot pulls out the stops. And Lee Howie couldn't prop it. Born. Good break on here again. Right away across the goal. A terrific finish there. The substitute with a spectacular score. Scott Taylor then, his third of the season, and an entrance in the grandest of styles. He came flying in there and really smacked it into the far angle. Still Sunderland pressing for that equaliser. Armstrong, 
Gray, and at the second attempt. Well, his lot there, a charmed life. Uh, pat on the head there for Phil Gray. His lot perhaps realising he made a bit of his own luck then. A win would have taken Luton into the top four, but that aspiration lasted barely half an hour. Sheffield United didn't allow them a kick in the opening 20 minutes, playing their own brand of total football with fullback Kevin Gage, the unlikely danger man. His second was almost an action replay of the first. Luton's attention is diverted by Carl Veart, and Gage is up there to pick up the pieces. Luton's resources, meanwhile, were being decimated. Priest and Linton were both forced off injured, and the 11 left on the field soon became 10. Gary Waddett was the last line of defence, but his emergency stop on Andy Scott was ruled a professional foul, and Waddock was off. Even worse, United were in the mood to take full advantage of Luton's aberrations. Mitchell Thomas's pass goes straight to Veyart, who, like the rest of the Blades' attack, was razor sharp. 3-0. Luton gambled everything going forward, however, and the ten men did fashion a typically well-made goal. John Hartson knocks in Julian James Cross. But the admirable emphasis on attack at one end made for a rather kamikaze state of things at the other. No defence against Veyart's clever back heel or the class of Clint Hodges. 4-1, but still time for four more goals in the 20 minutes remaining. Brian Gale thumps a header into his own net. And suddenly, United's defence were plunged into panic stations. Two minutes later, Gage collides with Thomas and Luton have themselves a penalty and a chance to pull it back to 4-3, which Marvin Johnson takes. Only for Luton's other fullback, James, to get in a real muddle with goalkeeper Jurgen Sommer and leave Scott an open invitation for United's fifth. Another from Veyart, two minutes from the end, made United the first away team to hit six in the Ensley League and suddenly, they're up to sixth. It's taken time to adjust and there was a lot of pressure on us because everybody thought we'd just storm through this division. And it hasn't been like that at all. The stand has been quite good this year. And uh, all the teams could seem to be able to beat all the other teams. There's no real outstanding team. So um, we think we've, we've made an OK start and we can only get better. because We usually get better after Christmas and start to get stronger. So we're quite confident we can put a run together and, and kick on from there. We can't compete with the Middlesbroughs or the Derbys or the Wolves or Boltons to that effect on spending money. We've actually raised a million pounds during the season start, but I still think we've got a squad that's capable of challenging and getting Sheffield United back into the Premier League. I'm ambitious, the players are ambitious, and that's what we should be you know, ensuring to do between now and the end of the season. Swindon's new player manager, Steve McMahon, decided to change a winning team and pick himself. He won't have that dilemma in a few weeks. Swindon were behind to Roger Willis's second-minute header. McMahon was booked and upset even more when Andy Edwards challenged Fraser Digby and knocked the ball in for South End second. But chasing the referee didn't get the frustration out of his system. Ten minutes later, McMahon and Willis went into a tackle. Down goes Willis, apparently struck by an elbow. McMahon does appear to raise his arm. He said any collision was accidental. But referee Steve Dunn reached for the red card. And Willis needed several stitches in a facial injury. Paul Gerrard kept Stoke out at one end. Poor Carl Muggleton made a mess of it at the other. Commentary from Jim Beglin and Rob Palmer. Sanford to Pesky Solido. Oh, looking for Carruthers. He's onside. He's got a chance. And that was more of a bad miss than a great save. Martin Carruthers took far too long. And it was, uh, it has to be said, a good save from Gerrard. But Carruthers will be having nightmares about this one. looking for a shooting opportunity, keeps going and going. Forced wide by Richard Graham. Blackhorn does well, he sent him, there are four waiting for the cross. Is it the goal? It's off the line, it's saved by Gerard. And poor old Martin Carruthers cannot score to save his life. No way past this man, Gerard, who was fortunate then, but from, what, two and a half yards out? Carruthers should have scored. Paul Gerrard, who many in the know say is an England goalkeeper in the making, already the under-21 
number one. And it was, uh... Oh, it's in! What a smuggle to none, he's left it! And he's gifted the game to Oldham Athletic. Carl Muggleton. Well, he had two bites at the cherry. The first was blocked down. The second, he completely missed kicked. And Sean McCarthy is not going to score an easier goal than that. Muggleton was struggling to get back. McCarthy, all he had to do was look up, see where the posts were, and make sure the ball found its way between them. And he did that very easily indeed. Another big step forward from West Brom. Barnsley's defence, beaten just once in eight games, were caught out early on by big Carl Heggs. Chris Jackson's neat header early in the second half had been coming, though, and for long spells, Barnsley looked like a team who'd won five out of six. But West Brom didn't buckle. Even better, nine minutes from the end, Ian Hamilton timed his run into the box just right. We're still a million miles away from where I expect, said manager Alan Buckley, but they're out of the bottom three. And at the bottom, Notts County refused to be cut adrift. Old boy Tommy Johnson was their chief tormentor at Derby, but that was as close as he got. Middlesbrough could stretch their lead to seven points if they win at Reading on Tuesday. Tranmere also play away to Notts County. Who are currently four points behind at the bottom. Bristol City, who also play this week at Barnsley, and Portsmouth have dropped into the bottom three. November's been another busy month for managerial changes, but these three managed to survive and prosper. Well done to Glenn Rhoda in Division 1, Dennis Smith in Division 2, and Mick Wadsworth in Division 3, November's Managers of the Month. As for November's Golden Goal competition, six nominations as always, you had to pick your favourite and then hope it coincided with the verdict of this month's judge, the Millwall manager, Mick McCarthy. The verdict is Gary Parkinson, the fullback, run from the halfway line, beat a couple of players on his way, checked on the inside onto his right foot and it was a, a bit of quality to bend it in the far post. I think it was 90 minutes as well. The fact that he got that still left in him, I thought he deserved it. And so did our ten winners. You all win an annual subscription to Matchday magazine, the official publication of the Football League. But who won this week's star prize? A VIP trip to an Ensley League game of your choice. The winner of the top prize is Tony Shoe, and he's from Rochester in Kent. In part two, next week's competition, there's another 70s mix of old faces and great goals. And could this be the year when Kidderminster Harriers are good enough on and off the pitch to make it into the Football League? Time now for this week's competition. Sheffield United's Carl Veyart got two of their Super Six at Luton on Saturday. We want to know his nationality. So, where is Carl Veyart from? To the first ten correct entries, there's a copy of the Ensley League directory. Send your answer and your name and address to Ensley League Extra, London Sports Network, London SE99 6YW and good luck. Kidderminster became a football town earlier this year. Nearby Birmingham were just one of the teams they beat on the road to the FA Cup fifth round and a superb season climaxed when they won the GM Vauxhall Conference. The team were ready for league football but their ground wasn't. So seven months on are they still as determined to make the big time. More so now than ever, to be quite honest, um, because uh, we're fully aware of the, of the situation in the Football League. Uh, you know, we're capable enough of being a Football League club. We've worked very, very hard over the last decade, you know, from, from nothing to build ourselves up to uh, a fully recognised club. And even recently, um, talking to clubs in the third division, you know, they're already saying, you know, I'm sure the Kidmiss would have been a, a tremendous attribute of this level of football. No matter how good the playing side, though, all non-league clubs have to pass stringent tests if they're to be allowed into the league. Kidderminster failed to gain the Grade A certificate because they failed to develop their quaint old ground in time to meet last December's deadline. They claim the FA Cup run prevented them developing their Agborough Stadium. Now they're confident it will comply. A new 1,000 all-seater stand was built during the summer with money from the Football Trust. And thanks to the magnanimous support of other conference clubs, Kidderminster were given a third of that sum to help them get that crucial upgrade. 
we were given uh, the bulk of that money on on the on the basis that if 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 the, if the money was spent and the ground was improved we would be okay for the football league as far as the ground was concerned and really to do that we needed the cooperation of the other conference clubs and they were superb in their support for us obviously there were one or two reservations which we understood uh, but we we're, we're very grateful and hopefully somebody else will benefit in a similar way should uh, more money come on stream uh, this coming year Wickham Wanderers are the latest role model for all aspiring non-league clubs, well-managed and well-marketed. And that's the key. It's not so long ago that smaller clubs like Aldershot and Maidstone United were going bust in the league. So how tough is it for non-league clubs to sell themselves in the community? Not as difficult as people may think. Uh, I mean, we have got, uh, in this moment in time, a situation where, for instance, all our, our matches right to the end of the season are fully sponsored. Uh, pretty well every advertising space on the ground is, is taken up. Uh, we've got future plans which uh, come into stage shortly with the nine executive boxes and all those boxes are already sold uh, you know, be, you know, before next season. I think what the, uh, the championship did for us last year was fully establish us as one of the top non-league clubs in the country and that was a, a sort of ten-year ambition fulfilled. Uh, but obviously you're always resetting your, your, your aims and, and your ambitions and uh, now the ambition is to become a football league club. But to do that it's up to Graham Allner to take his team the distance once again and get his hands on the conference title. Our all-round game, our passing game has been very, very good this year. Uh, we perhaps haven't scored quite as many goals as um, we would have liked with the, with the chances we've created and we maybe leaked one or two but I think the quality of our football has been first class this year and I, I think this team will get better and better. And the manager's optimism has been borne out by consistently impressive attendances. More than 2,000, the biggest crowd in the conference on Saturday, were at Agbara as Kidderminster, in touch at the top in fifth position, faced another non-league Midlands team with cup pedigree in Telford United. Black. <laughs> Black. We'll try and drown, please. OK, you're okay. Early on, there wasn't too much to admire in some rugged, determined football, but half an hour in, Kidderminster got the first break. Centre forward Del Humphreys does well down the left, and his cross is handled. Midfielder Richard Forsyth, a veteran of six seasons, beats Nick Goodwin with the penalty kick. Telford's preoccupation is more about staying in the conference and they did well to weather a good spell towards half-time. Striker Lee Hughes is one of Kidderminster's brightest young prospects and a new arrival this season. Allner's side continued to press in the second half. Hughes continued to threaten and when Telford only half cleared one of his crosses, Kidderminster were convinced they should have had a penalty. The Telford defence were adamant Humphreys had gone looking for contact and the referee agreed. And just three minutes later, Telford were more fortunate. Their more positive approach in the second half had started to cause Kidderminster problems and there's little doubt Jay Powell is late on Lee Wilson. Another penalty and Wilson gets up to thump the kick past Kidderminster's Darren Stedman. And George Foster's Telford have a well-merited equaliser. And try as Kidderminster did, they couldn't get back in front. One of their longest-serving players, Paul Davies, provided some of the better moments towards the end. Kidderminster's last win at home was back in October, so there's significant room for improvement, but no panic. I think our best is yet to come and if we can between now and Christmas keep our results ticking over uh, and keep in touch with the leaders then I think uh, we'd be looking to make a real push in the new year. Kidderminster are up to fourth but even if it's not this season you get the feeling that there's a real conviction they will get it right. From what I've seen of the third division with the greatest respect to the clubs there uh, I feel that the squad at this moment in time would be, be quite capable of holding its own whether we would uh, see the situation full-time if we wanted to push to the next le level, like Wickham Wanderers have done, 
then I think gradually, yes, we would have to change uh, gradually to full-time status. I think we would relish being a football league club because I, th because I think we could handle that and, and I think the club's sufficiently well set up now uh, to handle football league. Um, at times in the past where when we thought we may have been, possibly we weren't and now we've got the ground, the back, uh, back room set up and also the team which is very important I think to handle the football league. Last season it was the FA Cup, this season NC League clubs have burst a few Premiership bubbles in the Coca-Cola Cup. Millwall, Bolton and Swindon are into the last eight after some fabulous fourth round performances. Keith Stevens, the Millwall captain, one of their great stalwarts around the penalty spot for the free kick. Dave Mitchell just behind him. Oh, and it's gone straight in, what a remarkable goal! Greg Berry has given Millwall And suddenly the ball is presented to Perry, who could make it number two, and has done so. So, free kick to Bolt. Coleman's up inside the penalty area. This one from Miklosko is under pressure from Patalina. And West Ham are looking to the referee to award them a free kick, and Bolton have scored through John McGinley. So, Coleman is up on the near post cause maximum problems for West Ham and Mikloshko once again has come off his line and not got the ball this is Lee and it's 2-0 and it appeared to be a handball there by Julian Dix what on earth was he thinking about McGinley makes it three Bolton are heading to the last day to the Coca-Cola Cup Snakers is back on his feet as Bishop tries to find a path to goal. Cotty! He's got one at last! It might come too late, but Cotty pulls a goal back for West Ham United. Fjortov, 1 0. He's given the chance and he's taken it very, very sweetly. Carsley, cool, little chip forward to Johnson, it's in, and Mark Stallard pulls a goal back, Beecham with the ball in, here's Fjortoft, he's done it, he scored, and Fjortoft's got his second. Two for Fjortoft and two for Chris Armstrong as well as Crystal Palace overcame a slow start to end Aston Villa's hopes of a return journey to Wembley to defend their trophy. Next for Palace, the winners of the Manchester City-Newcastle replay, Uwe Rossler cancelled out Mike Jeffries' opener to take the tie back to St James's Park. For all those awkward front-page headlines, Arsenal still had too much of the right stuff for Sheffield Wednesday. And the Gunners are still in three cup competitions. And Ian Rush is still world class. A hat trick for Rushy in his 600th Liverpool game as Blackburn were given a battering. But Notts County couldn't scale the same heights that took them past Aussie Ardiles and Tottenham. Darren Eady's goal 43 seconds in was enough for Norwich City. And Norwich could become the next instalment in Bolton's amazing cup story of the last two years. Swindon versus Millwall guarantees Division One representation in the semi-finals. A special double whammy of nostalgia now from 20 years ago. Some classic action from the old Division Two as Manchester United go to Sheffield Wednesday. But Stoke City led Division One this weekend in 74 and they were away to Birmingham City. Sounds. Skills aiming for Robertson, gets it on for Greenoff, that looks useful. That's a good one! What a goal! Jimmy Greenoff! 1-0 Stoke! 15 minutes gone! And that is a goal that Jimmy Greenoff will remember for a long, long time. So superbly struck.
The ball knocked forward to him, just about the edge of the box. He chests it down in one fluid movement. Turns, pivots, and whack! Far left corner of the net. Latchford, no chance. Hudson takes it quickly, on for Moores. Might try one. Did! Scores number two! Now that's a way to take a free kick. That was a beauty from Jimmy Greenoff. It's 3-0. Jimmy Greenoff, captain of Stoke, former Birmingham player, really punished Birmingham for some very slack marking men. And there's an absolute logjam of players around that area. They're all in that area. Red shirts and blue and white shirts. The five-man wall and almost five men in a position to take the kick. Houston, try a goal! Houston directly from the kick. There was a hole in the wall. left a gap and Houston found it good corner there you go the United defence caught flat footed by David Sutley right from the corner nobody jumped to it and already they're missing Jim Holton surely that could have been Jim Holton's ball had he still been on the field instead he went right over the top of the red-shirted defenders and David Sunley, the man who stabbed it in. Come on, says Mr Baker, get on with it. Thompson right into the area. Got your goal! Big wall, six red shirts, one blue and white. Shaw shoots a goal! What a goal! My word, it, it didn't matter whether it was a penalty or not. Bernard Shaw's put it away with a blistering shot to make it 3 1, and what a game! McCallyog across. It's going to be forced in by McCall. Spring it, and the defence misjudged the cross the simplest thing in the world for Macari to stroke the ball home Morgan outside him goes Forsyth Forsyth's low cross Davis no Pearson it is in fact Pearson who makes it 3-3 lovely cross by Forsyth and all Pearson had to do and he did it so well was stab his foot at it and it shot past spring it and so Manchester United have pulled back again chipped up suddenly a goal it's in 4-3 suddenly Stepney being criticised by his defence because Stepney got his hand to the ball and punched it in fair inside the post but a, yet another lethal free kick. The ball chipped over David Sutley's header. And despite Alex Stepney's hands getting there, it went inside. And everybody's gone up except Greenhoff and Stepney. Looked like handball in the area, but it's not cleared yet. It's... Game. Live next Sunday on ITV, Luton versus Derby in the central LWT and Anglia regions. It kicks off at 2.55. Meridian viewers can see highlights of Portsmouth against Reading. Before that, Manchester United's last chance in the Champions League. All the European highlights later on Wednesday night. Check your local listings. And next Saturday, Wolves will have Don Goodman and the Dutchman John De Wolf in their squad at Notts County. They've signed for a total of 1.7 million.
That's almost it. Just time for a quick word with a man who's had a very successful week, a very happy man, Mick McCarthy. Mick, you've won at Nottingham Forest, you've beaten Wolves. It's not a bad seven days, eh? It's not bad, no. I might go out for a glass of orange juice tonight as well. Yeah, it's, it's been a good seven days. I'm just saying what a difference a week makes, though. See, the bloke behind me is knocking the place to pieces as well. A week ago, I was just saying, I didn't know which artery to cut first at Port Vale. I was, I was ready for doing myself in. And a week's time, we've had two good results, you know, beat Forest, beat Wolves today. When, so you, when you get to the end of the season, which do you think will be the more important result? If we've won the Cup, I would imagine the Forest game. I think the, the Wolves game today is a more important result. We wanted the points today. You mentioned cutting your wrist there. I mean, a lot can happen in seven days. Uh, ma managers have been mentioned recently in relation to the Brian Little case, and uh, managers might want to move on sometimes, and loyalty is an important word as well. Um, does Millwall's position at the moment in relation to you say anything about that particular issue? I wouldn't even discuss that, because people will uh, speculate on people's jobs, whether they're under pressure what is happening. I'm not going to be the one to start it, you know, you've only got to, have, you've only got to see it once. Somebody puts it in a paper and all of a sudden you're under pressure. Uh, but loyalty's all right, but it's, it's got to be both ways. There's no point managers being loyal to clubs and clubs sacking it in the drop of a hat on a whim. You know, let's see a bit of loyalty both ways. I suppose the problem is you, you've set such high standards in the two seasons you've had here that when you have a difficult spell, people immediately say he must be under pressure. Well, it's always going to be the case. I said six minutes to go here today, it was lovely to hear them, they were singing one Mick McCarthy. I, said, I just turned out the taff and I said, see if we concede one, and it ends up one all. I said, it'll be McCarthy out, you know. I mean, it's, it can be as strange and as fickle as that, but I don't feel under any pressure. I'm under pressure for myself to be successful and to do well for, for the club and for me personally. Thanks, mate. Nice to Pleasure. talk to you. you. Ensley League Extra is back next week, of course. All the goals, news and the features. Join us for that. Bye-bye for now. Ensley League Extra was sponsored by Ensley, providers of household insurance. We're in a league of our own.